Welcome to an election season edition of This Week in Missouri Politics. Too much to talk about to have a featured guest, so we have a couple folks returning. Ryan Burke, it's been a while, on the very first pilot episode of This Week in Missouri Politics. <laughs> yep. The R.W. Burke Group, welcome back to the show. Good to see you, Scott. Joe Manis, I would say, retired, but I, I don't believe that maybe writes a little less yeah, to these days. That's that's probably accurate. We're thrilled to have you back. Thank you very Thank much. You. Susie Moore, Red State, News Talk STL, a little bit of everything. Yeah. Thank you for making your first appearance on This Week in Missouri Politics. Happy to be here. And I love the red fingernail polish. I like that. I learned about that from my daughter this week. <laughs> and the other person I learned about fingernail polish you from, say David Barkley. <laughs> Uh, David Barklage, a dean of the Missouri Republican Party. David Barklage, thank you for the time. You're welcome. The Senate race, biggest thing going. Uh, it, it, it feels like it's becoming kind of a race, but, but is it a race? Well, first, use who it is. Those are my proper pronouns gotcha. today. Uh, no, it is not. I, I, I think uh, that uh, this race was baked the day the primary was over. Yeah. Uh, it, there are three kinds of races. The races that you can't lose unless you screw up, the races you can't win unless the other guy screws up, are a competitive race. And I think this is a race that Eric Schmidt can't lose unless he screws up. The data we're seeing out there right now is there has begun a shift in the electorate. I think the economic issues are starting overriding. We got initial data yesterday. It's showing the absentee numbers are off in Democrat areas. In 2018, just to give everybody a quick reminder, there was sort of a double wave. Urban areas waved to Democrats, rural areas, red areas waved to Republicans. So I didn't know if that's what we're going to see now, but I'm telling you the data is showing that Democrat absentee voting is dropping like a rock, that Republican voting, especially correlated to the more Republican areas, older uh, population, is starting to go through the roof. I think it is the early elements of the wave, and then we corresponded looking at Georgia and Pennsylvania and Ohio, and I'm starting to see the same trends there. Ryan Burke, uh, you're doing some work with the Bush campaign. Tell me the truth. I mean, where it, it feels like this could be a race. Is this going to be a race? I think it could be a race uh, simply because Eric Schmidt gleefully put into place the most draconian abortion law in the country with no exceptions for rape or incest. Joe, man, let's break this down for me. I, I've watched people that are pro-choice bring me polling that says, oh, 50-50, whatever. They might say a little one way or the other on abortion. But when people vote, the people that are motivated by abortion, they were 80-20 pro-life. Is the, is the fervor going to subside there, and is Trudy Bush going to be a beneficiary of it? Well, I think she's going to be a beneficiary of it. I've never believed the 80-20 uh, uh, anti-abortion side. I think it's more... 50-50, but in some cases, when you're talking about no exceptions, it's, it's like what you saw in Kansas, yeah. where it was 60-40 pro-choice, partly because they, people were concerned, women were concerned, about the lack of exceptions. I mean, it, it's going to be intriguing to me how this plays out. There was a part of this, though, where if you were pro-choice, it might not be your top region you voted. And for many people that are fervently pro-life, that's the reason they voted. And if you weren't pro-life, they wouldn't consider you. We thought the pool of people that were so fervently pro-life was just larger because they continually elected pro-life candidates. Now that there's no abortion, I mean, does that go away? That's, that's what I'm going to be looking at in November because the movement has been toward, more towards the pro-choice camp because women are concerned about the lack of exceptions. I mean, you hear all these stories about uh, women with miscarriages can't get the care they need, different things like that, which I think can move voters, whether or not it can move enough or whether or not it's going to supersede the um, economic issues is a question we'll see in November. Because I, I, I think you're right that the economic issues within some groups may be an overriding factor. But I still think for uh, women of reproductive age, this will have an impact. Susie Moore, tell me, this is a, you're right for red state. This is a red state. Is Eric Schmidt gonna win the red state? I think Eric Schmidt's gonna win, win the red state. The question is by how much. And I do think that the economic issues are gonna prevail. I mean, yesterday the CPI numbers came out last report before the election. And you know, while people feel fervently about abortion, they don't deal with it daily, day in and day mm -hmm. out, unless they are activists. So I think people, when they're going to the polls, they're going to be thinking about the gas prices, the grocery prices, the overall Let me economic. Let flip this back to you. If you're a person, I've always felt like in Missouri, I think that the numbers are somewhat close on your, just your general opinion on abortion. Mm -hmm. Most folks just want to talk about it mostly, probably. But if it's your top issue, that number of people that it's your top issue, the pro-life folks have always. I mean, there's a reason why winning candidates put pro-life on everything, right? Sure. Now that that issue is off, 
is pretty well done. Where does a person whose top is, whose main reason they went to vote was abortion? Maybe they make it one more election, but where do those folks go? Well, I mean, I think that they start going then to their second tier mm -hmm. issues. I mean, if, unless you're somebody who only votes for one reason and one reason only, mm -hmm. then you're going to be thinking about the other things that make a difference. And you're going to look at the policies that are being implemented by one, the party that's in charge and whether that's something that you want to go along with or, or move on to something different. Joe Manny, uh, I really think that in the day, you used to give 220 to the clerk and you could fill your truck up and they give you folding money back. Now you got to swipe your card twice to fill your truck up. I don't know how you get around, and I know there's major macroeconomic factors that go into that. I think most folks in their gut know that too, but still, the fact remains, when this really offensive jerk was in office, they'd give you folding money back from 220s. Now that this guy that I think most folks think is a good guy, you have to swipe your card twice to fill your truck up. Well, like you say, there's a lot of international factors, other factors that are involved in affecting the gas price in OPEC. <laughs> which just made those decisions a week or two ago. But I, I do agree with you on one thing. I think that the Republicans often are much better about getting a message and they just drive it, whatever it is. And I think in the case of uh, inflation, mm -hmm. gas prices, prices at the grocery store, Democrats tend to like wait till like December or January after the election before they finally get their act together on what their message should be. And that's been true on a lot of economic stuff over the years. I mean, that this was true 22 years ago on guns in Missouri, in Al Gore. So I think that may be what's driving some of this movement now. And it's got, the question is going to be whether or not uh, Democrats can finally coalesce around something saying, yeah, but if you want to fight inflation, what you guys are talking about is cutting Social Security, cutting the, I mean, whatever, whatever their message is going to be. Uh, but they haven't gotten there yet, and I think that's why you're seeing some of these numbers, because Republicans have done a better job of just pinning it on Biden, and there's not enough pushback. David Barker, you tell me. You got the old boy who's driving through Tipton, Missouri, goes to that nice gas station on the north side of the road with the Chester chickens, and he can see the eight-ball water tower. He used to hand him 20 bucks and get yesterday. folding money back. Now he has to swipe his car, tries to fill his truck up, and there, it's totally unfair to say it's one person's fault, but the fact remains, that's scoreboard, right? Yeah, the, the personal pocketbook issues are always the major driver. I, you know, the whole abortion argument, the, it's sort of problematic. I always sort of look at it, there's three different groups. There's the majority of America that were more Roe v. Wade in the middle and felt that abortion may not be the moral choice, but they weren't going to, like, throw someone in jail for it. Yeah. And then you have your people on each ends that are profiteering politically or whatever by sort of keeping an issue. The problem is, is that the abortion ruling took it both ways, and Illinois can be less restrictive. Partial birth, post-birth, whatever you want to do. In Missouri, there was less than 40 abortions performed under the law as it was. So I think to sustain an issue like that, the problem is it takes a certain level of activism, and I actually think that activism is hurting moderate Democrat voters with the party because you have people who feel so strongly about the pro-choice issue, but their voices are fairly dramatic. We just got out of a poll in a pro-choice district, and less than half of those voters were actually going to make their decision over the candidate's position on pro-choice. They were strongly pro-choice, but there were other things mitigating that. And that's where, as you said and others, those pocketbook issues come in to take over. Ryan Burke, I've seen Trudy Bush just start to hammer. No, I have a plan on how to make things cheaper. I have a plan on these things. What is a message Democrats have on explain gas prices or explain why you should be fired about abortion rights being taken away? Well, I think I would look to the Senate Democrats here in Missouri yeah. who offered an earned income tax credit that Andrew Koenig called uh, socialism or something ridiculous, something put forth by Ronald Reagan. So uh, now what Democrats are doing is, is so extreme that Ronald Reagan would agree with it. Um, you look at the $500 checks to individual taxpayers and $1,000 to married couples that they offered during session that the governor vetoed. And then you look at the fact that the Senate Democrats made sure that the tax cut we just did was more in line with helping working families and corporations, which is what the far right of the Republican Party here wanted. So champion for working class families is the, the Senate Democrats. I here. noticed this video that Rizzo put out, and it, it had issues that you might actually care about if you're a Missourian. It didn't have some of these extreme things that frankly, the Republicans want them to talk about, and they take the bait on, it actually talks about, I mean, you could have thought that, that you wouldn't have necessarily known it was a Democrat ad because the issues they talked about until the end. It was, 
He reminded you of like a Clinton type situation. It reminded you of something Jay Nixon or Claire McCaskill would have done. It wasn't some silly, goofy social issue thing. Yeah, I mean, that's why Tracy McCreary's race is so important. You're talking about a candidate, a Democratic candidate in St. Louis County that's backed by police, that's backed by fire, that's adamantly pro-choice. You know, when, when we talk about what's next, what's next, next with this Republican Party is coming after contraception and trying to put women in jail uh, who get out of the state. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, when you do introduce that bill that, you know, make it illegal to cross state line, people start to wonder. Joyce, tell me this. I mean, I, I think just politically speaking, as a, a co the coin okay. of the term you guys have made very well successful, if you look at it, I think the one place Trudy Bush's campaign probably make, helps Democrats the most is in that district going down to the middle of St. Louis County. That's a place where that Bush name is going to be very strong and well thought of. That's a place where a woman would do very well. And at top of the ticket motivates turnout. You may not think that's a competitive race in Nixa or West Plains or Scotland County, but you would naturally think a Bush would do very well politically and probably motivate you to vote. Well, I think she does have some uh, strong ads. I mean, she's done a good job with her ads. And um, I, this is unpaid advice to Schmidt. I think he come, I may have known him for years. Yeah. I thought I did. Um, <laughs> he just, he seems so stern in those ads. I mean, I mean, just as tactically, I'm like, why doesn't he kind of loosen up a little bit in some of his ads? Now, <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen him that stern outside of the TV ad. <laughs> yeah. Ever. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. I mean, I'm just talking tactically here, not, <clears throat> not, not taking sides. But I think, I think that how Bush does does help McCreary. But I would suggest that if McCreary has all these law enforcement endorsements, yeah. she needs to be pushing that more in her ads. I think that's a, that's a very good point. Tell me this. I, I think he's stern because the folks of the state, the overwhelming majority of Republicans, and I think a lot of his regular folks, are wanting somebody stern, right? Oh, I think he picked up on the fact that they want that fighter and that kind of yeah. tough guy um, mentality. Although I didn't think he seemed that stern when he was flipping the burgers on the grill. <laughs> That's true. That's true. We are, we are still the party of the Krabudgeons. Yeah, so. that's true. <laughs> Sorry. That's true. Fine. All right, Dave Barkley, tell me this. I mean, Trudy Bush Valentine, the one place you would naturally think Gussie Bush's daughter would run very strongly would be just take a swath of that I-170 corridor down through South County a little bit. I would think she'd be a benefit to Democrats there because they're going to think she can win. They're probably going to like her. So I, I think the nationalization of, of off your elections is going to be problematic in that regard. Yeah. And, you know, I almost feel like you're selling it because the Bush name, and I know the Bush name is revered. Well, I'm a German American. And, and it's probably yeah, tugging Patriot. at you, even as a Republican from, from Butler County, to not vote for it because well, I'm an American, so yes, it would. Yes. But with that regard, uh, no, I, we, we're in a race, the Haruza race, uh, with Tracy McQuarrie, and that is in this very sort of key corridor, and we're starting to see some very interesting data there. And, and I'm, I'm just telling you that you, your problem is, is that, that neither party is really that homogenous anymore. The Democrat party in that district, you've got your limousine liberals you, or your progressives, you've got your sort of labor that used to be more traditional, but they're more pro-veteran, pro-cop, things like that. That's cross-pressured with like Gory Bush. For, for, for Trudy to be able to sort of hold that coalition together, Everybody's making it tougher for her. Corey makes it tougher every time. Wow. Biden makes it time. Corey's, uh, I think Trudy's capable of it if all those other distractions weren't out there. But I think when you look at the Chris Coster, Jane Duker, all those mainstream operatives in the Democrat Party that are fairly centrist, you know, I mean, the, the Democrat Party in this election is losing a lot of them over a lot of these economic issues, cops and other things. So I think you have three Democrat parties on the ballot, and I think there's going to be a lot of splitting. Ryan Berg, are we going to see Tracy McCreary with some cops and firefighters on TV before long? I think you've already seen a lot of that. Yeah. I think you're going to see more of it. And uh, going back to the Bush campaign. I'm going to say I, you're anti-cop if the cops are saying, we want you to be the elected. Yeah, I mean, the validators are already out there for her. Um, she already has an ad out with a police officer. Uh, I can't remember exactly where, but, but advocating for her. She's got the St. Louis County Police Officer Association endorsement. Um, it's going to be really tough for the other side to, to flip that when police are with Tracy. So much to talk about. We're going to stay with this till after the break. We'll be right back. But first, go to showmissouri.com, History of Missouri, one county at a time. This week went down and talked to Dr. Oakley, Carter County, talk about all things from the Civil War right up to the modern day floating down at Van Buren. Show Missouri, the History of Missouri, one county at a time. We'll be right back after this. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. 
Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. My grandfather served in World War II and was a butcher. My dad worked the midnight shift at Anheuser-Busch. I'm Eric Schmidt, and these men taught me about hard work. In college, I gave tours and took out the trash at the estate Trudy Bush Valentine grew up on. As Attorney General, I've taken violent felons off the streets. As your Senator, I'll fight for the forgotten men and women Joe Biden's left behind. I approve this message because it's time to take our country back. All rise for Judge Mike Carter, Sundays on ABC 30, host of the Cowboy and Judge Show. Tune in for community advocate Judge Mike Carter and his celebrity guests as they discuss today's hot topics and big issues here at home in Missouri. Hear about the power of good from community leaders, business owners, students, charities, and tons of familiar faces. Court is in session with Judge Mike Carter on the Cowboy and Judge Show. Available at MikeCarter.com or Sundays on ABC 30. The Cowboy and Judge Show. Giddy up. Giddy up. The best conversations happen at the kitchen table, so I'm bringing the table to you. I'm Ann Wagner. Public servants need to listen to you, not the liberal mob. People care about kitchen table issues, like the skyrocketing prices of groceries and gas. And now Biden has you paying for someone else's college loans. Let's stop their madness. I'm Ann Wagner, and I approve this message to give you a seat at the table. Common Sense Conservative, Ann Wagner for Congress. Data captured by our state-of-the-art monitors helps us pinpoint the timing and location of severe weather more accurately and respond to trouble more quickly. Ameren Missouri's investment in smart technologies like this is one way we're improving reliability and restoring power faster than ever. Responding to trouble before trouble hits. That's energy at work. Ameren, Missouri. Welcome back to a very fun edition of This Week in Missouri Politics, election season. David Barklage, let's talk about something that is on the ballot. There he goes. <laughs> puff, puff, give, David Barklage. Some folks want to sell more pot. You don't want them to, right? Well, you know, I, I, I think this, the, the, the precedent of an industry that's highly regulated uh, writing its own laws is a bad precedent. This is the second time. First it was for medical, second is for this. And I think that when you add to a constitution 50,000 words, whether it's Missouri or the federal, 50,000 words, 39 pages of effectively regulations that are actually keeping you from much regulation, I think it's something to look at. And I think the records in Colorado and I think the records in uh, California deserve some pause. And I think even further, you have to look at the whole issue of even how it got on the ballot. I mean, you had a situation. Well, what's it actually do? So right now, the, the folks that sell the medical marijuana, they want to sell it without the medical part, right? It's, it's kind of the same framework. It feels like that the uh, existing thing, I think you'd have had people a little ticked off in some parts of the state if you had a bunch of marijuana shops everywhere. But I think they've been pretty responsible, pretty subtle, not rubbed. If you drive down Missouri Boulevard in Jeff City, you wouldn't know that's even but a you know, It's one thing to legalize if someone wants to have a joint. It's another thing to infuse it in candy, cookies, potato chips. We saw nationally where the cartels are using colored pills and other things to make fentanyl more attractive to younger people. It's hard, imagine as a parent, you, you know, trying to keep your your child away from gummy bears, all these things, you know, all well, my over dad the didn't do a very good job keeping me from gummy bears. <laughs> Ryan Burke, uh, it does feel as though that, that you have these Republicans say freedom, liberty, right? But but not now. The, the, the folks voted for, uh, for medical marijuana, as they've done almost every state they've ran it. And it's a, it's, a, it's a program, right? You come in, you get medical. No one really cares. Nobody notices. Because, I mean, as a German-American, pot is, I'm not a pot customer. I also have no idea when anybody's on pot. I just walk through my little hun life, happy as I can be. Now they want to do recreational. I, I, it seems like it would pass. Yeah, I, th I think it, it probably will. Um, I'm in favor of it. I haven't... Unlike David, I'm, I'm not working on it on either side, so I haven't had the time to read all the specifics. I am interested to hear David talk more about, um, you know, why he's against it, um, because I just haven't read enough of it. You know, man, it's just interesting for Republicans, right? I mean, the Republican Party, you think, law and order, I'll put that doobie out. 
Now you have some of them that are for it, some of them that are against it, but, but it's weird. Nobody's saying you shouldn't have recreational marijuana. They're just saying, oh, we don't like this framework. Well, I think that's one of the things the Republicans, some Republicans are arguing about. Then you've got, I think, this is one of those issues that people privately may have more um, nuanced thoughts about it than what they say publicly. Now, I did a story for St. Louis Public Radio several years ago about this is right before the, rec the uh, medicinal marijuana was passed. And I did see some of the products which are needed. Not everybody smokes. I don't smoke. But if you're, if you're a cancer uh, sufferer or other things, they do use like gummies or other things just to kind of ease the pain. But we have pain. that with medical already. Correct. But my point is, um, I, think, um, I think both campaigns, uh, which I haven't seen a ton on yet, uh, and I watch TV, um, I think both campaigns probably need to be more clear about what they're talking about. Because people, I think, are legitimately concerned about people who might be high on marijuana or whatever behind the wheel. But on the other hand, it is, and this has been true for decades, many uh, studies have shown that it's not as scary as people who are alcoholics. Well, I tell you what, first of all, I know Tom Tithen and ABC will appreciate you watching television, and we know a certain Lebanese firefighter <laughs> that would tell you the same thing. Susie Moore, let me tell you about the people that, um, that, that my mom is your pro-life Republican. Mm -hmm. She don't favor smoking pot. That sure. was very well explained to me when I was a kid. <laughs> right. I kind of think she probably just votes no on anything, but I'm not sure you've heard the message. Right now you've heard the message of, oh, we don't want too much. We don't want this regulation. Yeah. That's a little nuanced than to put your doobie out, right? It is, but it's interesting. At, at News Talk STL, we've had several people on that have a position on the issue, and the, the no push is coming from the we don't want this as a 39-page Add addition to the Constitution, not that we oppose the concept of recreational marijuana. I've not seen the big push for we just don't want it across the board. I also haven't seen the big push for we want it and we want it this way. But, but I, think, I think that part may be coming. What I think is interesting is getting a yes is hard if yeah. there's organized opposition. Mm -hmm. I've seen organized opposition. I just haven't seen them on TV, right? Right. So David Barclays, take your political head off for a second. Right now, we, we've talked a lot about this, all, all these races in terms of, you know, we're, we're literally talking about Republicans trying to win races in districts they shouldn't in St. Louis County, frankly. Right. They're the underdog when they I start. Agree. Take your hat off with the Republican hat off. What do Democrats need to do to be more competitive? Well, they, they run the same problem we do is uh, their, their party's fractured around some, uh, we, we, the, the mainstream public has pulled back from politics, allowing effectively ideologues to take control of the parties. And to that extent, that extremism on both sides is putting, I think, our country at risk. But it's, it's a challenge to the Democrat Party because Democrats are in urban areas, yet they're doing everything they can to create crime as an issue. And so they're working against their own issues in that regard. And so crime has got to be addressed. But the problem is they have a fair, active constituency that feels dramatically different, and I'm not sure they have answers. I don't think, I think both of our parties are plagued with people that don't care about the answers. They love the rhetoric, they like the extremism, they like the power it gives them, they like the way it feels to talk about, and that's putting both parties' interests at risk, especially it's working against Democrat interest. I think Trump and what happened there happened two years ago. I think now that it's the Democrat Party's turn is having to face these issues themselves internally. Joe is that you've watched this for a while. I'm not sure the state does well the supermajority of any party, especially an ideologically aligned supermajority. Right. I don't know what Democrats do. I mean, I, I watched this week in the Senate race, they took some tweet by Eric Schmidt and tried to turn that into some big, and I, I think that's the kind of cancel culture stuff that regular people roll their eyes at. It's very hard to attack other folks when you kind of have to be endorsing Cory Bush. And so you go down a slippery slope of, of challenges, but what do you do? What, all the fracturism is fine, but in Missouri it's worked for Republicans. What, what needs to happen in this state to get a little more balance in it? Well, I think that, um, I mean, people forget that as late as 2016, the majority of statewide office holders in Missouri were Democrats. So uh, I think that the party needs to look at, okay, what made us so successful then? Why are we not successful now? I think they, they know the answer. Could Jay Nixon win a primary today? 
Possibly. It depends if what he's running for. But if I, the most successful politician in the history of Missouri couldn't win a primary, and you have to think about it for a second, maybe that's a problem, right? Well, it could be. I think it depends what he's running for. But I think, I think that uh, the Democrats take for crime, for example, it's it's a national issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Republicans are throwing out all this stuff, but they're not throwing out any answers. And I think that, de but Democrats have not done a good job of countering with that. They're just standing there. As I said, it reminds me of the gun issue in mm -hmm. 2000, where they just stood there and they waited till like two or three months later before they finally came up with a coherent answer. And I think that um, Democrats need to do a better job of pointing at Republicans and saying, okay, you're throwing out all these problems, but where are your proposed solutions? Ryan Berg, is, that, is, there, is there a natural tie to, you know, the Republicans love winning and, and, and Democrats, while they would love to win too, they take governing very, very seriously. So maybe they hold their stuff back until legislative session starts because that's what they care about the most. Well, I think the new Missouri Democrats in the state Senate are leading the charge on exactly yes. what we're talking about. You look at the uh, law enforcement bill a couple years ago led by Brian Williams, bipartisan support, um, great bill. You look at the economic proposals we had discussed earlier during session, one of which was vetoed by Governor Parson, and then you look at this special session where the right wing was trying to go after corporate tax cuts, and the new Missouri Democrats in the state Senate made sure that we got tax cuts for well, working families. Today. Tell me this, Ryan Berg. Uh, I mean, J.J. Rizzo, I think there's a very good case to make he's the most talented politician in the state right now. Will he run statewide? I don't know. Probably not. There's a reason for that, right? I don't know. I can't speak for what J.J. is going to do in the, or Senator Rizzo will do in the future. Well, um, I can speak what Tom Pitt is going to do. He's going to kick us off the air here in a minute. So <laughs> with a minute left, do one the week. I'm going to, bittersweet, Ray Wagner. Uh, yes. His commitment, leadership to his business or to the business, to the community, to his family uh, is going to be sorely missed. And that's probably the bittersweet part that at a point where Ray deserves to be able to go fish and spend time with his family, the community probably needs him to step up more than ever. And so Ray has deserved his retirement, but I hope he doesn't actually take it. Who won the week? Mark Montavani. Oh, yeah, he's coming on. Yeah. Interesting race. Yeah, it is interesting. Let's we'll talk about that next time. Who won the week? I'm not sure anybody did. I think it's just too much chaos right now. I, 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 it's a little I, chaos. I, I really think so. <laughs> Who won the week? Trace McCreary and Vicki England, both running strong <laughs> campaigns, <laughs> one for state senate and one for county council. That might be proof it's a strong campaign. <laughs> Before we kill Barclay, I'm going to say Teresa Parson and the Neelyville Jag, JAG group. She went to the greatest educational institution in the state, Neelyville High School, to see the JAG Corps last week. So the, uh, the first lady of a terrific visit. Very nice for her to come down. We'll see you next week for a visit if Barclay is still alive on This Week in Missouri Politics. This Week in Missouri Politics is sponsored by the Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, Ameren, Spire, and Sterling Bank.